Welcome back. Well, after that last lecture, you may be thinking, what's the big deal? What does it matter how you turn genes off? If you turn genes off by methylation or by mutations changing the base sequence, what does it matter? Well, it matters. The big deal is that methylation responds to your environment, providing a long game of gene-environment interactions so that experience can echo in our genes across generations. Thus, things like diet can change your non-DNA inheritance through methylation. People exposed to famine in, in the Dutch famine winter, they had less methylation of an insulin growth factor 2 gene. That's a gene involved in regulating how you use sugar, and it controls the growth of the embryo and the placenta. This was tested when the Dutch people were in their 40s and 50s, so the effect clearly persisted long after in utero. Well, in other words, the environment in early pregnancy will affect you late in life through methylation changes. Now, famine is obviously an extreme case of altered nutrition. All nutrition, so nutrients are scarce, but it does give scientists a pretty useful tool to look at how nutrition can change our epigenetics. So, for example, Swedish scientists found that if your grandfather or grandmother went through a famine, you would have lower mortality risks than if they gorged. But only if you were the same sex as the grandparent who starved or gorged. So grandfathers starving or gorging when they were 9 to 12 years old only changed the grandson's mortality risk. Grandmothers gorging or starving only changed the granddaughter's mortality risk. A follow-up study in England showed that childhood smoking in fathers produced fatter sons but not daughters. Well, these studies then, taken together, suggest that methylation is happening to the X or Y chromosome. It's not clear where or how, we're still just scraping the surface of mechanisms here. And the big problem is that it's hard to do experiments with people, and epigenetic signals are hard to detect in traditional genetic and epidemiological studies, which is probably why it's taken so long to discover them. What scientists can do, though, is to turn to mice and rats. Mice are the genetic model of choice for studies on human physiology. Most of what is true in mice is going to be true in you. That's why mice have something to say about the human obesity epidemic. Because just like us, fat mice are at greater risk of heart disease, diabetes and cancer. Well, here are two mice that, believe it or not, are genetically identical. They don't look genetically identical. They don't even look like the same breed of mouse, do they? But they are. They're a breed of mouse called a gooty. So called because they carry a particular gene, the agouti gene, that makes the rodents ravenous and yellow. Back in 2000, Randy Jertle, who was a professor at Duke University, and his postdoctoral student, Robert Waterlum, set about to see if they could change the unfortunate genetic legacy of these little creatures. They found that the agouti gene can be turned off by methylation. Mice with the agouti gene turned off are still genetically identical to their fat yellow kin, but they're skinny and brown because of methylation of the agouti gene. Moreover, they did not display their parents' susceptibility to cancer and diabetes. They lived to a spry old age. The effects of the agouti gene have been virtually erased. Well, how is this possible? It's nutrition again. Typically, when fat yellow agouti mice breed, most of the offspring are identical to the parents, just as yellow and fat as pincushions. But the fat yellow mother of the thin brown mouse had to diet rich in mefold donors for two weeks before mating, as well as through the pregnancy and lactation. Mefold donors are found in many foods, including onions, garlic, beets, and in the food supplements, such as folic acid, often given to pregnant women. The implications are, then, that every pregnant mother who has been taking a folic acid supplement has been engaging in an experiment in epigenetics. An experiment, because it may not be one size fits all. Our DNA sequences are different, so our methylation patterns will also be different. There may be the potential to suppress beneficial genes, but we don't know enough to say. Now, scientists use these agouti mice to gauge how a wide range of diet and chemicals and other environmental conditions are going to affect epigenetic control of gene activity in animals, probably including humans. They're looking for conditions that tip the balance for methylation, thus between genes that are off and those that are on. They found that a lot of chemicals, stress or other factors that interfere with methylation shift the coat colour and health of the mice, and sometimes in very unexpected ways. In 2012, Jertle's group reported that low-level radiation signals cells to shut down agouti activity, thus making the mice 
healthier. Vitamins and other antioxidants that intercepted this signal promoted the unhealthy state. Gentle in an interview said he wasn't ex exactly excited about the result at first. He said, nobody wants to think that low dose radiation could be advantageous and the stuff you put in your vitamin pill would be bad. However, the results suggest that radiation may help modulate the immune system by altering methylation of DNA in immune cells. That's interesting to know, isn't it? May mean that a certain amount of radiation may be good for some of us. Well, who would have guessed that? But some of the other results obtained by Jertle's group have been really disturbing. Bisphenol A is a chemical found in most plastics. Millions of tons are produced per year, and 95% of us have detectable levels of it in our urine. Jertle's group found that bisphenol A blocked methylation of agouti mice genes so that more of their progeny developed into the yellow obese mice than, than they'd expected. But with the rise of obesity in Americans coinciding with the widespread use of bisphenol A in everything from water bottles to dental sealants, there's been speculation there might be a causal connection. There's also a majority opinion among experts that the number of people with autism is increasing in our populations. Bisphenol A alters methylation in the mouse forebrain, making the pups more introverted. And a study on pregnant monkeys fed bisphenol A found that their babies had a condition resembling autism. More bad news. Bisphenol in the male line affects sperm. It is passed epigenetically across at least three generations in rats. And these are just the results for bisphenol A. So far, the Jertle Group and some other researchers working on rats have documented measurable effects from a host of environmental pollutants, including pesticides, a synthetic estrogen used in some birth control pills that raise cancer susceptibility in the daughters, granddaughters, and great granddaughters of pregnant rats, and a variety of different uh, fungicides which have been closely. That reduced male fertility even in the fifth generation. Well, in the past, it was assumed that variations between people in the health risk from environmental chemicals just depended on genetically determined variation in the proteins involved in transport and metabolism and excretion of these chemicals. But in future, it seems that setting standards for safe levels of exposure to chemicals may need to take into account epigenetic effects as well. There's also a good side to our epigenetics being labile and easy to alter. It's some consolation that Jertle's group found that giving the agouti mothers methyl donating substances counteracted the reduction in DNA methylation caused by bisphenol A. They also found that a constituent of soy protein products called genistein prevented an increased number of unhealthy offspring. Well, no one can yet explain exactly how epigenetic information gets passed to the next generation. But the clues we have suggest a role for small RNAs called pi RNAs. They direct modifier proteins to attach methyl groups. We've attached an article to the uh, lecture for those interested in the details, such as we know them. What is clear, though, from epidemiological studies in people and molecular studies with animals, is that prenatally and just before puberty are key periods when the epigenome is very susceptible to disruption by external factors such as emotional stresses and smoking. These will affect you later in life and they'll affect your children and the diseases they get. It will at least, in part, set your children's lives trajectories and those of their children. What young people do today is writing the map of illness in the world for 100 years' time. The map has been written for us already.